Good morning, everybody. I am Jelina Mekali. I am a pediatric nephrologist in the University Hospital of Leuven in Belgium, and I am uh, leading a PKD a research group in the KU uh, Leuven uh, University. I would like first to thank Ron, Frank, and the CPAT for inviting me to participate to the PKD Summit and for giving me the opportunity to present the advancing in the research of pediatric ADPKD. Here are my disclosure, all paid to my institutions. I would like to start um, with uh, Jared Grantham, who wrote in 2015 that pediatricians are usually on the alert for autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, although much more common asymptomatic ADPKD usually goes unrecognized. However, evidence is mounting that renal injury commences with the formation of the first cyst. The medical world has been slow to recognize the fetal cyst formation is also an important feature of ADPKD. Consequently, it is appropriate to alert pediatricians that they will be treating young patients in the years ahead. Indeed, until recently, ADPKD was considered as an adult onset disease, as many patients remained post-symptomatic during the first three decades of life. Testing of asymptomatic children in families with a positive history of ADPKD was a matter of controversy with the difficult balance between not medicalizing asymptomatic individuals and not missing treatable disease manifestation at an early stage. Since then, the importance of the pediatric spectrum in ADPKD has been highlighted and there is a clear wind of change in the management of this population. Besides the well-known adult onset, ADPKD have a high phenotypic variability and is spanning over the entire age range starting from childhood. Very early onsets or even severe prenatal cases mimicking a RPKD are also described. It is indeed reported that 2 to 5% of the ADPKD patients present in childhood with a broad phenotype. Some of them are presenting to our clinics because of symptoms or are prenatally diagnosed because of nephromegaly and or hyperechogenic kidneys with already the presence of the first cyst. Some are incidentally diagnosed during imaging for another reason and the last group is really undergoing an active clinical testing. So comparing the presentation symptoms uh, in childhood to the adult ADPKD, children are also presenting with renal urinary tract infection, decreased urinary concentration ability, hematuria, which mainly um, associated with cyst hemorrhage after a trauma. In contrast to the adult, extra uh, renal manifestation are very rare. However, I would like to highlight that proteinuria and more important, hypertension are very common already in childhood ADPKD. It is already accepted that the cardiovascular disease is the predominant cause of morbidity and mortality in adult ADPKD and hypertension occurs in 60% of the patients with ADPKD even before renal impairment. As mentioned in the presentation of my colleagues in this session, the benefits of an intensified blood pressure lowering on TKV has been demonstrated in adult population. Furthermore, the pathophysiology of hypertension is multifactorial. And besides the important role of cyst compression on the renal vasculature, there is a clear endothelial dysfunction. 
A meta-analysis revealed that 20% of ADPKD children had hypertension, including more than 900 patients, with an increased incident with age. Very interesting, the Colorado group demonstrated that ADPKD children with blood pressure at the higher end of normal, between the 75 and the 95 percentiles, have already an increased left ventricle mass index compared to normotensive peers. And this correlated already with renal volume. This finding highlights that the endothelial dysfunction is already present from childhood. The same group demonstrated that the TKV was significantly increased in high blood pressure and DPKD patients as compared with the normotensive children, but also the total cyst volume and even the kidney cyst numbers were also more increased in the hypertensive group. Very interesting, a recent large European study have evaluated the blood pressure of ADPKD children using the 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. It has been demonstrated that even in asymptomatic children, 35% have confirmed hypertension. 52% demonstrated no nocturnal dipping and 18% presented with nocturnal hypertension. This study pointed out the high prevalence of hypertension in children with ADPKD before developing any symptoms and argued the need of active screening of this treatable disease modifier. Indeed, Based on the more large studies with longer follow-up periods in non-ADPKD but in children with CKD, it has been demonstrated that intensified blood pressure control with target 24 hours blood pressure level in the low range of normal have a substantial benefit for renal function. We might extrapolate these benefits to the ADPKD children and aim also for intensified blood pressure control. Also, the proteinuria and the albuminuria are common in children and correlate with hypertension and with the severity of renal disease. This has been reported to be in 20% of 508 children. Proteinuria is also known to be a marker of CKD and its management might have prognostic benefits in the disease progression. However, no RCT are available in children. So with all the available data on ADPKD childhood, an international consensus paper, including pediatric and adult nephrologists, geneticists and patient representatives provided clinical practice recommendation on diagnosis and monitoring children with ADPKD. More recently, and together with Charlotte Schimpel and Carson Bergman, we also proposed a simplified diagnostic and workup flowchart to facilitate the counseling and the management of these children, highlighting the importance of the blood pressure monitoring, even in asymptomatic or at-risk children with ADPKD. In addition, and awaiting more evidence, we highlight the importance of the lifestyle approaches with, which are all recommended for children with chronic kidney disease. And I would like to take the opportunity to spotlight the excellent ADPKD route map which is available in several languages and represents a very easy tool for informing and counseling ADPKD patients. Last but not least, the therapeutic potential of tolvaptam has been recently investigated in a double-blind randomized and controlled trial in children and adolescents with ADPKD. The target population was aged 12-17 years. However, subjects aged from 4 to 11 were also allowed to enter if eligibility criteria were met. The co-primary endpoints were changes from baseline in spotlight, uh, sorry, 
The co-primary endpoints were changes from baseline in spot urine osmolality and specific gravity at week one. Additional endpoints at month 12, like change in TKV and EGFR, were also explored. So with 91 subjects enrolled from 20 study sites in Belgium, Germany, Italy, and UK, phase A has been completed and early results are really promising and in line with the expected activity of TG2 receptor antagonism. The preliminary pharmacodynamic, efficacy, and safety information will be presented at the next ERA EDTA. So, as presented by the other speakers in this section, a lot of work has been performed in adult ADPKD to categorize the T severity. Several prediction models are currently used to help counseling patients and designing clinical trials in ADPKD adults. Although the interest in ADPKD children is growing, there is currently no validated prediction factors, and this is mainly because studies are scarce, including small cohorts with short follow-up and no defined endpoints. Furthermore, with a growing child, many hurdles are met in ADPKD children research. As EGFR is not reliable to monitor renal function, TKV is not validated as a predictive factor, especially that normal kidney growth is still unknown, and the available imaging tools are sometimes infeasible in young children. Indeed, TKV measured by MRI is validated disease progression marker in age, adult ADPKD. However, MRI is burdensome in children and requires sedation or even anesthesia in young children. So currently, the 2D ultrasound is the method of choice for examination for pediatric patients in our daily clinical work. However, TKV measurement based on ultrasound via both ellipsoid formula and direct method have been shown to be less accurate and less reproducible compared to the MRI TKV. That's why we developed together with our pediatric radiologist Luc Braissems a novel 3D ultrasound method where the ellipsoid and the manual contouring TKV were calculated. Compared with the MRI and the 2D ultrasound, the 3D ultrasound countering was the most robust alternative for MRI in early ADPKD children. We are applying this method in our routine since several years now, together with the 2D ultrasound. An adapted software has been developed and together with Luc Braissens and Frédéric de Kaiser, we assessed the height TKV based on the manual 3D ultrasound countering in our genotyped ADPKD children followed longitudinally. So using the Mayo classification model, we have aimed to develop a severity group stratification for children. However, the start point of the model of the Mayo is 150 milliliter at birth. So we optimized the starting point and adapted it to a pediatric data using small and different measures as starting TKV points. We were able to stratify severity characterization in five approximately equal size groups which we called the Leuven adapted Mayo pediatric classification. However, as used in the Mayo, these starting points were also arbitrary and we were not very satisfied with these results. Indeed, there is no data available on normal height adjusted TKV in a growing child population. So we went to the literature and we evaluated all our cases to the reported data on TKV or on ultrasound data, 
published from a uh, uh, Colorado group of from the Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital um, cohort. And we see indeed that the ADPKD children have a clear accelerated uh, growth in comparison with the normal uh, children with a stronger deviation from later ages, approximately around 10 years. Indeed, Next to the height increase, we have also a very clear height velocity increase around puberty, making the importance of the use of height adjusted TKV instead of TKV alone in these growing children. So we propose and we adapted the uh, Mayo uh, classification uh, sorry, sorry. So we propose a novel model based on a new formula and combined with severity characterization in five approximately equal size group with an average percentage growth per year increasing at higher ages, which led to a more homogeneous distribution of the cohort. We believe that our new model is more adapted to the pediatric population, and we are currently validating it with other cohorts in collaboration with the Mayo team. Here we can also see in all the patients that were scanned multiple times are connected, and their growth evolution mostly follows the severity characterization of our model. As next step, and in collaboration with Peter Harris, we are also exploring the value of the genotype and the possible additional hypomorphic variants in this population, and we will correlate it with their height TKV using our new model. Next, together with Hans Potter, we are also exploring several formulas in estimating the EGFR, as the variability is very important and we are uh, exploring our longitudinal data of the same population, and we will also correlate it with the genotype and with the heights adjusted TKV. Next to the TKV and the GFR, <clears throat> research in finding novel early biomarkers are still needed. We have published recently that urinary MCP1 is already increased in our pediatric cohort with a very early renal phenotype. This encourages us to perform more research in this area. So, as mentioned before, there is really an unmet need for large pediatric cohorts for longer follow-up and more longitudinal data to be able to produce more accurate and adapted prediction models and validated our data. For this, we initiated together with Max Libo and Franz Schaeffer, the ADPKD registry for gathering information on large ADPKD children. This is an online platform aiming to generate data on incidence and the presentation in childhood, to identify progression factors, and to assess the effect of our current management on the long term. All the patients younger than 19 years of age with the diagnosis of ADPKD will be included. In the database, there is a detailed basic data questionnaire, including genetic, familial history, and initial diagnosis. In combination with retrospective data, such pre- and perinatal data, then we will focus on the initial visit at diagnosis, and then we record yearly follow-up visits. In between, this initiative became a worldwide collaboration with the very nice um, collaboration of Lisa Gay Woodford, Andrew Mallet, and Detlef Bockenhauer. At this moment, the project is composed of 94 pediatric nephrology centers from 36 countries 
And we succeeded already to include more than 1,200 ADPKD children across the world. These numbers are growing daily as a lot of the new centers join us and are very active in Cluny. So Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America share one common database, while United States, United Kingdom, and Australia have their separate database, which is fully interoperable with the initial database. Very important to highlight that all these databases are harmonized and we will pull the data together. And I would like to thank Angelique Dashik for her commitment in this project. So you can see that Europe reached almost 1,000 uh, patients. The other continents are currently very, very active and I expect increased inclusion in the coming months. Here you can see the distribution of the inclusion per country. Again, several countries are awaiting eti uh, ethical approval uh, to start. However, the commitment of all these centers is really enormous. So as a teaser, because we are now currently analyzing uh, the data of these 1,200 children, but I would like to uh, present you some preliminary uh, data that we did a few uh, months uh, ago on 824. So these patients are diagnosed at the median age of six years with an almost equal gender distribution. It was very interesting to see that the majority of these children were diagnosed at really younger age. When we analyze the reason of diagnosis, we see that only 8% of ADPKD patients are diagnosed because of symptoms, such as UTI or hematuria. Sorry. When we analyze the reason of diagnosis, we see that only 8% of ADPKD patients are diagnosed because of symptoms, such as UTI or hematuria. 27% are due to an incidental finding, and almost 10% are already diagnosed prenatally. Very interesting is that 39% of the ADPKD children are diagnosed with active screening. Genetic was performed in almost the half of the cohort, and the patients are mainly PKD1 as expected. So we are currently collecting details data on kidney imaging, on kidney function, but also very detailed cardiovascular involvement. This data will allow us to reinforce the research in pediatric ADPKD, and we will have this analysis also soon. So I would like to conclude that the pediatric nephrology community has made huge progress on understanding the disease spectrum of ADPKD in children. It is currently accepted that structural kidney disease and the vascular dysfunction are evident in ADPKD children, and recommendations are defined to improve the management of this population. Indeed, Children and young adults with ADPKD may represent the critical therapeutic window to reduce future renal and cardiovascular risk. The importance of treatment of the disease modifying factors, such as hypertension, and improving the lifestyle early in life might impact the long term outcome. The promising results of the first interventional tolvaptan study will be presented in the next ERA EDTA in June. To be able to design further safe interventional trials, it is critical to establish reliable measures to stratify ADPKD children and identify those with the highest risk for rapid progression. I am very eager to discuss during the live PKD summit on the value of the age at inclusion, the use of height adapted TKV, the value of the blood pressure at endpoints and the value of EGFR in this population. Also, to open the discussion on the unmet need for more research on early biomarkers in ADPKD children. And finally, 
I think that the World Wide Web based ADPKD registry initiative demonstrated the strong collaborative commitment of the pediatric community to improve these gaps by raising awareness of ADPKD and will help to generate further observational evidence. So I would like to uh, thank the PKD research group uh, from Leuven and all our uh, collaborators from uh, other uh, departments. I would like also to thank all the collaborators, uh, specifically from the Mayo Clinic, Peter Harris and Vincenzi Torres, the ADPKD Consortium, and many thanks to Max, Franz, Lisa, Detlef and Andrew. I would like to thank Galapagos and Otsuka who support our research. And last but not least, I would like to thank Ron, Frank, Wendy and Kitty for organizing this amazing PKD summit. And my last thank go to the ADPKD children from my clinic who help us to move on in the research and who made this artistic kidney. And thank you very much for your attention.